Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Romana, for joining us today. Uh, I would like to ask you to elaborate on some of the things that were in your presentation. Um, and I'm looking specifically at uh, what you um, described when talking about the type of uh, nuclear reactors proposed for New Brunswick. And so looking at, at point four in your presentation, talking about what's proposed for Moltex, mm -hmm. uh, you had written uh, and you had presented um, that it would likely not operate reliably and you, you mentioned there were basic material problems inherent in the design of a molten salt reactor. I'm wondering, can you elaborate more on that so we can fully understand um, what, what you're talking about here? Yeah, the um, Moltex is a molten salt reactor design. And uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, the only experience we've had with a molten salt reactor is at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the United States, uh, the so-called molten salt reactor experiment. Uh, and it was designed to produce uh, 10 megawatts of heat, but uh, the, even this design power level was never reached. Uh, and uh, the operators who were trying to operate it ran into some difficulties, uh, even at the very low levels of uh, power that it started off at. And so it never reached even uh, 10 megawatts, as I mentioned. Uh, and it turned out that, you know, the designers of the reactor had miscalculated some of the heat transfer characteristics, et cetera, et cetera. But the more important thing is, even at this low power level, you know, remember, 8 megawatts thermal translates to maybe uh, about uh, 3 uh, megawatt electric. Uh, the uh, reactor operated for uh, just around 13,000 hours over four years. In, our, in other words, around 40% of the time was when it was operating, 60% of the time it was down. Uh, in comparison, if you look at uh, the average commercial nuclear power plant in the United States uh, these days, it's, it operates around 90% of the time. Uh, and uh, during the, its operational lifetime, the molten salt reactor experiment was shut down 225 times. Uh, and of these 225 interruptions, only 58 were planned. Uh, and there were lots of technical problems, including, you know, plugging of the pipes that led to the uh, beds that were intended to capture and remove radioactive materials. But the blowers that were removing the heat failed. Uh, the fuel draining through the so-called freeze valve safety system that was intended to prevent an action uh, uh, stopped the reactor, things of that sort. So there's been a long history of all kinds of problems that have been happening. And as I mentioned, these are uh, problems which have to do with the basic uh, technology uh, rather than one particular uh, instance of that. And uh, this is actually why the United States, after the, after the molten salt reactor experiment was shut down in 1969, decided not to scale that up in the 1970s. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if you can speak a bit more to the those basic materials that you're talking about, as you said, you know, sodium hasn't changed its properties over time. Um, and as you mentioned, it reacts violently with water, it burns if exposed to air. Can you talk about some of the, the issues that come up if something goes wrong? Like, how would they repair it? That, you know, speak to that, please. Yeah, absolutely. So sodium has uh, some other properties as well that uh, we have to think about when you're talking about repairs and so on and so forth. When sodium is inside a nuclear reactor, it can absorb a neutron and convert into um, a, a radioactive form of sodium, which has a strong gamma emission. And so any kind of uh, repairs dealing with sodium uh, in a sodium cooled reactor will have to be done remotely. Uh, the second property and a very obvious property that one has to think about in the case of sodium is that it is opaque. You cannot see through sodium the way you can see through uh, water. And that means that you cannot actually see which fuel rod is bent without the use of extremely sophisticated tools. This is the reason why in uh, sodium coal fast reactors around the world, when there have been shutdowns for one reason or the other, a small sodium leak, a small fire, things of that sort, those uh, outage periods have been extremely long. Uh, so those, that's, I think, what the challenges with sodium cooled reactors. So if you build one of these, you cannot expect it to be operating 
at the kind of high capacity factors that we see in can-do reactors or in light water reactors. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for explaining that. Um, and, and I guess uh, in your presentation, you did talk about recent experiences. Um, for example, in France, as recent as 2009 is when they shut down uh, their Phoenix reactor. So this isn't all just technology from many decades ago. This, um, some of these examples are fairly recent. Um, and, and you spoke about um, India as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering, can you speak about, um, you know, is there an economic rationale? Can you speak about the issue of reprocessing and extracting plutonium from spent fuel? Yeah, the great question. So uh, reprocessing has also been part of uh, the nuclear dream for several decades. Uh, and there have been three motivations for reprocessing. The original motivation was the reason why reprocessing was done in the first place was to extract plutonium to make nuclear weapons. The bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki was produced through reprocessing. And that was the original motivation. The next motivation uh, was in, came about in the 1950s when people were envisioning uh, a very large expansion of nuclear power around the world and concomitantly thought that we would run out of uranium. Uh, neither of those has happened. Uh, the uh, expectations for nuclear power were grossly uh, exaggerated and the actual capacities have been far less than what was expected. And at the same time, we've also found that the world has a lot more uranium that was expected in the 1950s. So that sort of uh, blew away the second motivation as well. The first motivation is still there. That's a separate issue. Uh, the third motivation then for people who are advocating reprocessing was that it would be a way, a way of dealing with nuclear waste. Uh, and the argument was, by reprocessing, we're going to be able to reduce the volume of the waste. Now, uh, that's, a, a, again, a slightly misleading point for a couple of reasons. First is you should remember that reprocessing is a chemical process. You are adding some chemicals and uh, trying to separate out different elements. It cannot do anything to the radioactive nature of some of the materials that are in the spent fuel. And those things are going to stay radioactive, and you have to deal with them uh, in multiple ways. So what reprocessing essentially does is uh, try to split up the radioactivity that's contained in one um, can-do uh, spent fuel unit uh, and divide it into multiple waste streams. And each of those waste streams will have to be dealt with separately. But the most important point is that the radioactive materials that have the most problematic properties, namely the ones that have long-lived uh, radioactive lifetimes, those will have to be put inside some kind of a geological repository, assuming that's the way that society decides to deal with this radioactive waste. And the size of a repository is not really set by the volume of the waste, but more by the amount of heat that is generated, which is depend on the radioactive materials, and also on other um, packaging that you require to bury the waste. So uh, the bottom, again, what we can sort of see from experience around the world is that, uh, and studies of uh, repositories, is that the size of the repository is not going to be very uh, dependent on whether you do reprocessing or not. Uh, nor does the need for a repository go away. And frankly, I'll also say one last thing about these repositories, which is that the, even the idea that you want to reduce the size of a repository and that's somehow going to make it easier to deal with nuclear waste is misleading because the challenge with trying to uh, host a repository or find a site that will, a uh, community that is willing to host a repository has not been that of cost. It's not the cost of the real estate that is holding back things. It is the... Uh, the challenge of trying to persuade people that they should allow these very hazardous substances to be buried near them where that can possibly harm their descendants for tens of thousands of years. That's not an easy sell in any case. Mm -hmm. And so trying to reduce the volume of waste is really not beside the point. So back to the fundamental question. So what is the rationale for reprocessing today? It can't be because we are running out of uranium or we are going to building too many nuclear plants to be uh, able to fuel. It can't be that that's a way to deal with uh, radioactive waste. So ultimately, the only uh, rationale that still exists today is that you can try to separate out plutonium to use it in nuclear weapons. Now, I'm not saying Canada wants to do that. 
but I'm saying that if you are going to develop that technology, that possibility cannot be ruled out. Okay. Uh, and it depends on who you're exporting the reactor to. Thank you. And that, that leads me into um, the, the last question I'll have time for, um, Professor Ramana. As the Simons Chair in Disarmament, Global and Human Security, um, I think I must ask you about the issue you just brought up, or about nuclear pro proliferation, about safety, about disarmament. So if you could uh, share your, your comments on that, that would be appreciated. Thank you. You know, the nuclear weapons have been uh, the challenge, have been a global problem since 1945. Uh, and the community around the world has been trying to get rid of these since the very beginning. The very first resolution at the United Nations was to abolish nuclear weapons. And in 2017, um, the vast majority of countries around the world got together to sign uh, the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons, uh, the TPNW. And, uh, you know, many, many countries have signed it, have uh, ratified it. That's the one promising development we have in the thing. In the meanwhile, of course, we have situations like what's happening in Ukraine uh, with Russia and the United States and NATO sort of uh, kind of facing off indirectly and all the threats that we know. The Ukraine crisis also brought to light another very important uh, danger that we have known about theoretically for many, many decades, but we are seeing for the first time, which is that of having a nuclear power plant operate in a theater of war. And the Zaporizhia nuclear plant has been so close to having a major accident for months at this point, uh, and the, the risk is still existing. Right? So these are, I think, very odd times to be thinking about expanding nuclear power given these dangers at this point. Okay. Uh, my time's expiring, but I want to say uh, thank you uh, for joining us today. Thank you so much. Yes, Mr. Romano, that uh, concludes our time for questions uh, today, but I'd like to offer you a, a moment to make some closing remarks if you'd like to take that opportunity. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to deeply extend my appreciation for being allowed to testify to this, uh, to this committee. Um, I think that you are... Uh, at the juncture where you are making a larger decision than just about small modular reactors. Uh, it is a decision about how to move forward on the challenge that Minister Holland talked about, which is about decarbonizing uh, your uh, state's uh, energy supply uh, and how it can contribute to the larger national goal and the global goal of trying to deal with climate change. And at this time, I think we have two challenges primarily with this. One is that of cost and the other is that of time. And I think small modular reactors fit neither of those criteria. They are going to be too expensive and they're going to be too late in coming. And I think it's best not to sort of go in this, uh, in this direction, which is basically going to be a dead end.